Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's best books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 52 books per year and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each book. Today, I'm going to cover The Truths We Hold in American Journey by Kamala Harris. This is book 35 of 52 for my 2020 reading list. This is part of a special series I'm doing in the lead up to the election. I'm going to cover one person per episode in the next four weeks. I'm going to read one book about or by each candidate and then cover that on the episode. So the focus is really going to be what I learn in this book. I'm going to try to keep all outside influences away in the sense of what I've learned from news or family and friends. I I want to cover what I learn in these books. Uh, Most of what is presented outside is one way or the other in the sense of either this person is the most angelic being ever created or they are from the pit of hell. I, I want to get to know them from what they have said. I realize that that can be very biased. We may not be getting anything negative about these people in the books that they have written, but that is the goal here and that's the objective of these episodes. I would hope that by the end of these four episodes, you would not have any idea who I favor. My goal is to to present the information as I am learning about it in these books. So today I'll be covering Kamala Harris. Next week, I'll be covering Donald Trump. The week after that, Friday, October 23rd, will be Joe Biden. And then after that, the final episode will be Mike Pence and Joe Jorgensen. So there'll actually be five candidates that I'll cover. Joe Jorgensen is the libertarian candidate, and so I will cover her in a joint session because Mike Pence has not written a book, but his daughter has. So I'm going to read the book his daughter has written about him. And then Joe Jorgensen has not written a book. And so I will find what I can online about her and then uh, cover her as well. The election is Tuesday, November 3rd of this year. As for this episode, it will consist of four segments. The first will be information about Kamala. The second will be professional details. The third segment, I'll cover three policy stances and or beliefs that Kamala carries and that stuck out to me. I mean, this book is full of, of her policy stances, but I'm, I'm going to highlight three that stuck out to me. And then in the fourth segment, I'll cover, like I do in, in all my other episodes, I'll cover the one thing, the one key takeaway from this book, the thing that I, I always hope to remember about Kamala Harris. So I want to start by reading from page 43 of the book. She's on the campaign trail early in her life at this point, and she says this, I was always more than happy to talk about the work to be done, but voters wanted to hear about more than just policy. They wanted to know about me personally, who I was, what my life had been like, the experiences that had shaped me. They wanted to understand who I was on a fundamental level, but I'd been raised not to talk about myself. I'd been raised with the belief that there was something narcissistic about doing so, something vain. And so even though I understood what was motivating their questions, it took some time before I got used to it, end quote. The reason I highlight that is it, it ties into the reason I wanted to read these books about the candidates. I, I was more interested, I'm interested in their policy, but I, I want to know also their, about their lives, about their experiences, the things that shaped them, the, the turning points in their lives. I, I wanted to know those stories. And so that's, that's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm sharing this. And so I, I, was, I was glad to hear her address that in, in the book itself. And so to start with, in the intro- introduction, Kamala shares how to make the connect, correct pronunciation of her name. And she says it's like using the, the comma, comma the, the, like the punctuation mark. So comma, and then with a law at the end. So comma law. Kamala. And it in it, it means in Hindi it means a lotus flower. And so that's that's what her name means, but you pronounce it pronounce it as Kamala. This book weaves between family and professional the whole whole way through. So there's not like the beginning section is just about family and then she goes into politics and then she goes into something else. It's it just it, it goes back and forth. So it's it's neat in that sense. Uh, and then the very end of the book is a what I've learned. And she highlights five or so uh, heuristics, uh, kind of rules that she lives by in, in everything, and then gives examples of, of how she came about them or how she, how she uses them in her life. And you, you, you see those, those rules kind of throughout the book, uh, even before she addresses them. You see how she addresses different policy issues or 
uh, things she comes up against with with these rules. So it, it was neat in that sense, just that everything kind of wove together. And then also that you have this end s- section with, with kind of rules for life. So starting in, in segment one here, just want to go through uh, her timeline and really more of the on the personal side of her life. And then in the next segment, we'll get more into her professional life. So she was born in 1964, which puts her in Generation X. And so she's 55 years old. She'll be 56 in on October uh, 20th. So in 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 a few weeks here. And the reason I highlight that is I will highlight that for each of the candidates. And it goes back to the book Generations that I read in 2017 and and covered on the podcast in a previous episode. But there's a really fascinating piece of of information about generations and the presidency. I, and I, I find this stuff fascinating, but we have never had a president from the silent generation. The silent generation is anyone born roughly between 1925 and 1942. They come after the GI generation and the GI generation are, are those born from 1901 to 1924, but they're the people that fought in World War II. And so you think the greatest generation, the, the book by Tom Brokaw, he, he's talking about that, that GI generation. They were the go-getters, you know, they went to war, they took out Hitler, they 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 were they were go getters and so the next generation after that is called the silent generation just because their parents were were the not not silent they were the they were the opposite and we have never had a president from the silent generation we've had plenty of people uh, try to become president from the silent generation but i just find that interesting so after silent you have the boomers we've had three boomer presidents trump clinton and bush w bush and then we've had one Gen Xer, Obama. And so Kamala Harris is Gen X. I'm also Gen X. I was born 1980, so I'm right at the tail end. Uh, Kamala Harris was was more towards the beginning of, of Gen X. But just kind of want to put it in context. What, what that also means is that her birth in 1964 was in the midst of the chaos of the 60s. And she was, she was right dead center in the middle of it because her parents met at Berkeley. Her mother's name is Shamala, and she was born in Southern India. She graduated from the University of Delhi at the age of 19 and then applied for grad school at Berkeley in California. She got there in 1958 to pursue a doctorate in nutrition and endocrinology in order to become a breast cancer researcher. She received her PhD at the age of 25, which is the same age when she had Kamala, and Kamala is her firstborn. Kamala's father is named Donald Harris. He is a Jamaican, and he was at Berkeley studying economics, And he, where he is now a professor of economics at Stanford University, her, her father Donald is. And her parents met participating in the civil rights movement at Berkeley. And so uh, some of Kamala's earliest memories are actually being in a stroller at these protests on Berkeley's campus and in other places. Kamala also has a younger sister named Maya, so the two daughters. When Kamala was around five years old, her parents separated and they they uh, they were divorced the rest of the time. I, I don't believe her mother ever remarried. Kamala and her sister Maya were largely uh, raised by her mother then. And Kamala says that her mother uh, understood that she was raising two black daughters. And so, uh, as Kamala says, she knew that her adopted homeland would see Maya and me as black girls, and she was determined to make sure that we would grow into confident, proud black women, end quote. So they spent a lot of time at a black cultural center called the Rainbow Sign. And I want to read from her description of this. This comes from page 18 and 19. The Bay Area was home to many extraordinary black leaders and was bursting with black pride in some places. People had migrated there from all over the country. This meant that kids like me who spent time at Rainbow Sign were exposed to a dozen, dozens of extraordinary men and women who showed us what we could become. In 1971, Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm paid a visit while she was exploring a run for president. 
Talk about strength. Unbought and unbossed, just as her campaign slogan promised. Alice Walker, who went on to win the Pulitzer Prize for The Color Purple, did a reading at Rainbow Sign. So did Maya Angelou, the first black female best-selling author. Thanks to her autobiography, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. Nina Simone performed at the Rainbow Sign when I was seven years old. I would later learn that Warren Widener, Berkeley's first black mayor, proclaimed March 31st, 1972, Nina Simone Day to commemorate her two-day appearance. I loved the electric atmosphere at Rainbow Sign, the laughter, the food, the energy. I loved the powerful orations from the stage and the witty, sometimes unruly audience banter. It was where I learned that artistic expression, ambition, and intelligence were cool. It was where I came to understand that there was no better way to feed someone's brain than by bringing together food, poetry, politics, music, dance, and art. End quote. From there, she, uh, not a whole lot of details from, from there, uh, until college, but once she's in college, she gets to Howard University in DC, and that's in 1982. And her descriptions of Howard University are very similar to how Tanahesi Coates described it in Between the World and Me. And uh, th- so they both went to Howard, and I mean, it was just they viewed it as such a magical place, and they both v- blossomed there. And and so it was neat to uh, to contrast those those descriptions of, of both of their times at, at Howard. After Howard, she attended the U, uh, University of California Hastings College of Law, where she studied law, obviously, and then was elected president of the Black Law Students Association. In 2009, her mother, her mother passed away. Her mother was kind of the, her shining light, uh, Kamala's shining light, and uh, she, the, the, that has been the greatest loss in, in Kamala's, Kamala's life. In 2014, August 22, Kamala married Doug uh, Emhoff, and they, uh, Doug had two children from a previous marriage. Their names are Cole and Ella, named after John Coltrane and Ella Fitzgerald. And so Kamala has uh, these, these two stepchildren and just has a, a fantastic relationship with, with them. So that's a little bit about Kamala on a personal level, and the next segment we'll get into more of her professional life. From a young age, Kamala knew that she wanted to work in the, in the district attorney's office. So just a quick overview of her, her professional life. She served two terms as district, district attorney of San Francisco. She served two terms as the attorney general of California, the entire state. And then most recently, she has served as one of two senators from California, the other being Dianne Feinstein. From 1989 to 1998, she worked at the Alameda County district attorney's office. And she had a number of different roles there and uh, kind of got her, her, her feet wet there. In 1998, she joined the San Francisco district attorney's office. And then in 2004, she became the district attorney of San Francisco, which is a an elected position. Uh, Gavin Newsom was sworn in as mayor on that same day. In 2010, she became the attorney general of California, located in Sacramento. And at, when she was there, she went after the banks. So 2010 is a, a few years after the, the mortgage crisis. And uh, she saw a lot of families struggling because of, of foreclosures and, and things related to, to that. And so she, she created the California Attorney General's Mortgage Fraud Strike Force and got a deal out of the banks for 18 to $20 billion to, to help, help offset the, the pain and suffering of, of the people in her, in her state. Uh, at the beginning of the negotiations, it had started. The banks wanted to give two to four billion, and and she was able to get eighteen to twenty billion out of them. She also uh, developed a, a relationship, a, a friendship, uh, I, I should say, with with Bo Biden during this time, who was Delaware's Attorney General, and they became friends and colleagues, and they were both uh, uh, instrumental in going after the banks during this time. In 2015, she announced her candidacy for the U.S. Senate. And then on January 3rd, 2017, she was sworn in to the U.S. Senate by Joe Biden. The, she, uh, she quickly joined four different Senate committee, committees, and those are the, the Intelligence Committee, Homeland Security, Budget, and the, environmental, the Environment and Public Works Committee. In 2020, she was chosen as the VP candidate by Biden after she was one of the candidates for for president. So that's the quick overview. Uh, the, obviously, the book goes into to much more details about uh, much more detail about each of these positions. Main thing I want to highlight is that she has has worked 
in, in, as a district attorney uh, in the district attorney's office, as an attorney general, and as a senator for 28 years. And she highlights a lot of that experience. And I'll get into that a little bit more in segment three. But one thing that I thought was really neat was just how she would build upon her experience. So she would see something at a very local level at the Alameda County DA's office. And then she would take what she learned into the San Francisco DA's office. She would take it to when she had more influence as the district attorney, she would implement some of her ideas and, and things she saw. And then she became the attorney general and she could she could do it on, on a broader scope. And then as a senator, even even a broader scope. So uh, during those 28 years, it, it was it was really starting local and then and then expanding it and wanting to get into different positions to expand her abilities. She made uh, or, or her influence. She made she made a comment that as a lawyer, she would have an impact a case at a time, but as a policymaker, she could have a much broader influence. Now in segment three, I'm going to cover a few different beliefs and policy stances that Kamala has. She, she discusses a number of them in this book. These are three that stuck out to me. But before, before I get into those, I just want to cover her definition of a progressive prosecutor. And this is what she wanted to be. And this is her, her vision of, of someone who used the power of the office with a sense of fairness, perspective, and experience. Someone who is clear about the need to hold serious criminals accountable and who understood that the best way to create safe communities was to prevent crime in the first place. End quote. The first policy issue that I want to discuss was her was her view on truancy. You may think that that's kind of a minor issue in the grand scheme, isn't it? But uh, this is this is what she thought about. She realized that there was a shift that happened around the fourth grade with with students, and that shift was where they went from learning to read, going to reading to learn, and so if they if they had not made, if they could not make that shift, if they were not at the point in their reading comprehension levels that they could make that shift, they were going to start to fall behind, and that would put them on a path that often led to dropping out and poverty. And so you you would start to see students not come to school as much if if they were they were at that point and they were just not able to 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 read to learn. She then took that knowledge and was seeing on the other side that. 80% of the prisoners in San Francisco were high school dropouts. And so she connected these two and realized that by focusing on the truancy, that that could have ramifications further down the road. So I'm going to read one, one thing here. I went to see the school district superintendent, a wonderful woman named Arlene Ackerman, to ask her about the high school dropout rate. She told me that a significant percentage of their habitually truant high school students had missed their elementary school classes too, for weeks, even months at a time. That, to me, was a call to action. The connections were so clear. You could map the path for children who started drifting away from the classroom when they were young. The truant child became the wanderer, who became the target for gang recruiters, who became the young drug courier, who became the perpetrator or the victim of violence. If we didn't see that child in elementary school where they belonged, chances were we'd see them later in prison, in the hospital, or dead. Some of my political adv advisors worried that tackling truancy would not be a popular issue. Even today, others don't appreciate the intention behind my approach. They assume that my motivation was to lock up parents, when of course, that was never the goal. Our effort was to designed to connect parents to resources that could help them get their kids back into school where they belonged. We were trying to support parents, not punish them. In the, in the vast majority of cases, we succeeded. End quote. Uh, another thing that she did was uh, she would try to locate, uh, well, in, in these cases, the the parents would, would oftentimes be divorced. And so the mother would be taking care of the child and the mother would, would working two jobs to try, try to make ends meet. Uh, but the father wouldn't even be aware that that the child was, was truant at, from school. And so they would, they would make an attempt to, to notify the father. And in some cases, the father would, would get involved and, and bring this, the child to school in the morning or, or, or whatnot. So that was another interesting uh, piece of, of all that. Uh, this did result in rates of uh, reduced truancy. And the reason I highlighted this, this 
policy issue, this belief on on her, something that she was fighting for? Is, is it because it ties together a lot of her core beliefs? I mentioned in the end of the book, it has her rules for life. And, and two of those are test the hypothesis and go to the scene. So with this one, she would go to the school. She would she would talk to to students. She would talk to teachers. She would talk to parents. And then she would also see on the other side of, of people in prison and, and she was prosecuting people. And so she she would see the the different scopes, the the beginning and, and the end. And uh, and then she would test different ideas and and come up with a hypothesis and then test to make sure that that what they were putting into place was was working. And then she would build from there. So it, it, she would start at the the smaller local level. And then as her her jobs increased in scope and her her positions, she would then expose these ideas at a higher level, uh, attorney general and then even as as senator. So the next policy policy issue, uh, number two here is same sex marriage. Now, in 2000, California approved a ballot initiative that was Proposition 22 that defined marriage between a man and a woman. In 2004, remember in 2004, she became the district attorney for San Francisco, and at the same time, Gavin Newsom was sworn in as mayor. That same year, in 2004, Mayor Gavin Newsom decided to allow same-sex couples to proceed against the will of the voters, according to Proposition 22 or Proposition 22. So when he did that, Kamala Harris actually went to City Hall and began performing these marriages. They were they were later invalidated uh, because they were they were against the Proposition 22. Eight uh, four years after that, eight years after the initial prop Proposition 22, Proposition 8 passed the same day same night that Obama was elected, and this passed in California, and it prohibited same sex couples from marrying in California. This was an amendment to the California Constitution, and so it couldn't be overturned by legislature or the state court system. It had to go f- through the, the federal courts. Fast forward to 2013, Hollingsworth versus Perry. This, this eventually ended up in the Supreme Court, where they ruled that proponents of Proposition 8, and remember again, Proposition 8 prohibited same-sex couples from getting married in California, so proponents of that uh, the S- Supreme Court ruled that proponents had no standing to appeal. And Kamala was at the Supreme Court in 2013 for that hearing. And then in 2015, there was marriage equality uh, across all 50 states, according to the Supreme Court. So again, interesting that uh, that when, Gover- when Mayor Newsom went against Proposition 22, she was one of the first ones at City Hall to begin performing these marriages, and she was the district attorney of San Francisco at the time. Number three, policy issue, uh, beliefs. This one was, she went after the banks, and there was a period uh, after the mortgage crisis where a lot of people in California were, were suffering. They were being foreclosed upon and they were in bad mortgages and they were, they were having to, to leave their homes. And so she was seeing a lot of this pain firsthand. A lot of, of people were writing her letters telling her of this pain. And so th- they, they went forward to where the banks were offering to help appease the situation by offering two, two to four billion dollars. And Kamala said that was not enough and she fought it. She ended up getting 18 to 20 billion for the state of California to to use to to assist those who were being foreclosed upon. She actually at some point called Jamie Dimon directly and got him on the phone, the CEO. And so it just kind of showed her being not afraid to go after first powerful groups, just going after the banks and then also powerful people, just even calling Jamie Dimon directly, which uh, wasn't expected and uh, especially with her everything was supposed to go through through lawyers. So that that was the third thing that that really stuck out to me. I'm going to end this segment with four different quotes that that uh, were interesting. The first is this. I've seen a lot in my years of public service and what I've learned can't all be boiled down, but I've come away with a firm belief that people are fundamentally good and that given the chance they will usually reach out a hand to help their neighbor. End quote. That was interesting uh, after all she had seen uh, as a district attorney, attorney general, seeing some of the worst of, of mankind and seeing 
perhaps some of the best as well, but uh, she described some of the things she saw uh, with some of the cases, and it was not pretty. She was she was in the sexual crimes division for for a while, and the things she saw and heard were were quite awful. Uh, but but she says that people that people are fundamentally good. So that was that stood out to me. We'll go towards the beginning of the book here. Here we go. An important part of, of that wisdom told me that when it came to criminal justice, we were being asked to, f- to accept false choices. For too long, we'd been told that there were only two options, to be either be tough on crime or soft on crime, an oversimplification that ignored the realities of public safety. You can want the police to stop crime in your neighborhood and also want, that, want them to stop using excessive force. You can want them to hunt, hunt down a killer on your streets and also want them to stop using racial profiling. You can believe in the need for consequence and accountability, especially for serious criminals, and also oppose unjust incarceration. I believed it was essential to weave all of these varied strands together. End quote. Another one about the police. I've been to too many funerals of officers killed in line of duty, but I've also known this. It is a false choice to to suggest that you must either be for the police or for police accountability. I am for both. Most people I know are for both. Let's speak some truth about that too. End quote. And then the last one about patriots. Victories can be won or lost in complacency. Battles lost can be won with new effort. Every generation has to recommit to the work, to the effort, and to the true meaning of the word patriot. A patriot is not someone who condones the conduct of our country, whatever it does. It is someone who fights every day for the ideals of the country, whatever it takes. Now on to segment four, and the one thing that I, that has stuck with me about Kamala's life. I want you to imagine for a second that you're in a particular job, a particular role, and you get a, a call from the top person asking you if you are interested in the the top position in the in the company. Would would you do it? Would you take it? And just in general, what percentage of people do you think would jump on an opportunity like that? Well, in 2014, U.S. Attorney General Eric Holder called Kamala and asked her, do you want, are you interested in the U.S. Attorney General job? Are you interested in my job? I'll be, I'll be stepping down. And she told him that she would get an answer back. She, she needed to think about it. And when she thought about it, she, she realized that she was in the midst of her work as Attorney General of California. She had a lot of things that she was right in the middle of. And were she to leave at that moment, despite the the incredible job offer she would be she would be leaving in the midst of all these things that she had in place so she ended up saying no she ended up turning that that offer down and i i, I just thought that said a lot about her that she was willing to forego this job she adored obama and so she would have been working for obama uh she would have had the 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 top attorney general position in the in the country and she turned it down to to continue to see the things through that she was doing in California. That's the main thing that stuck out to me about her her life. Uh, one one other thing that uh, that that you see throughout this book is just the influence of Kamala's mother in her life, and her mother instilled in her a, a very strong belief in the individual, that the individual can make change. And then through Kamala's life, she sees that through government, she can also make big sweeping change. So there's the individual level, but it's not all about the individual. There's the government level, but it's not all about the government. There, there's, there's a balance there between the individual and, and the government. So to recap, I hope you got to know Kamala Harris a little bit more. Next week, I'll be covering Donald Trump. The week after, Joe Biden and then Mike Pence. And I will try to keep a, a similar format. So I cover personal life. Uh, professional life, policy issues, and then one thing that stuck out about their lives. That's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I'd love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com. Let me know what you thought about this episode or other ones. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can do that at booksoftitans.com forward slash support. You can also follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. The website is stock full of resources to help you find the best books and to create your own reading list. I'll be back next week covering Trump 
And that will be the second of this series of four episodes. Until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.